Hi, everybody. Um, so as you mentioned, uh, my background is in interface technology. And uh, I realize the title of this talk is somewhat controversial, um, especially once I add on the uh, no such thing as convergence. Uh, it sort of wanders into the territory of heresy, uh, in at least uh, the mind of some uh, of the popular media messages. Um, but let me back up to something slightly less controversial. This is a line that we're probably all very familiar with, which is the exponential supply of computational power per dollar. Um, it's related to Moore's law, but this is one way we can think about it. But what's not often on this graph is uh, this line, which is the capacity of human attention. And this hasn't really changed much over the past 100 years or so, and in which case some people could argue it's going down. If you look at a modern computer these days, there's actually very little computer inside of them. This, uh, this green area roughly comprises the motherboard and processing power component of the laptop. The form factor of our devices today are greatly dominated by the input and output services. And these are determined by our biology, the size of our fingers, how many pixels we can see in the, the eye, uh, how many words we can read per minute. And so what's happened over the past few years, I think it's not too hard to claim that we've reached this age of good enough computing. We've reached a point where we actually have a surplus in computing power that's beyond our ability to actually use it all. What's happened as a result of, of this, instead of having $50 laptops, what's happened is that we've had an explosion in the diversity of computing devices that are economical to, to manufacture these days. Um, and I know you can claim, I could stand here and claim that there's no such thing as convergence, and people will point at the phone in their pocket. Uh, and yes, there's no doubt that the phone is indeed getting much more powerful. But I would say there's, everything else is also getting much more powerful as well. Uh, when I empty my pockets, I actually have many other things that actually contain computing power within them. My keys, my credit cards, my security ID, all of these have processing chips inside of them, and it's only because of the, the availability of computational power can we start putting chips into smaller and smaller things. So while the phone may be much more powerful than the other, I actually carry five computers in my pocket and don't even think about it. So there's no convergence in the pocket because the phone is not serving the purpose of those other devices. And not, they might start to encroach on them, but for the most part, they continue to become more specialized. If you look at cameras, you can basically buy a camera these days for just about every single uh, specialized purpose you can imagine. Uh, yes, you might have an SLR, but now you want ones to strap to your helmet, you want ones that go underwater, you want stereo ones, you want ones you can wear. So there's not really any convergence here either. If you take the tablet space, which is the current popular form factor of discussion, uh, even though it has a pretty tight constraints on what it means to be a tablet, there's a quite a bit of divergence here as well. You get $35 tablets in India. You get tablets just for reading. There's, of course, the iPad. But some people want styluses, and some people want keyboards. And so even in this very tightly constrained form factor, there's not really convergence here either. And this is just a matter of the Darwinism of free market competition, which drives diversification among the species of devices we encounter. So not convergence. And although it might be attractive to look at the electronics industry in this simplified picture, in reality, if you plot out the form factors on a chart, it looks much more like this. You can buy a product of basically any form factor you want of inch size increments, ranging from small feature phones to large televisions. And if you think about the interface technology we use to interact with these, it actually plots out very nicely. The mouse and keyboard are very successful in this range of devices, which is human scale devices that are within the arm reach. The desktop mouse and keyboard do not work well for small phones. It does not work well for big TVs. Similarly, the value of touch maximizes itself right around the phone. Uh, in small devices, there's a, there's a premium on real estate. You, before touch interfaces, you either had to make your input surface bigger or your output surface bigger and make the other smaller and, and, and compromise. But touch screens allow you to maximize the entire surface area for both. As surface area gets cheap, the value of touch goes down. Making your television touch screen is not a very smart idea or it just hasn't been very commercially successful. Similarly, motion and remotes, motion and, and remote controls maximize their utility on larger screen inf interfaces. 
On this plot as well are some other interesting aspects, such as where productivity mostly happens. Most of it happens at our human scale devices, and consumption or devices at the other ends of the spectrum are almost entirely consumption oriented. So, when you talk about the mouse and keyboard and whether or not we're going to replace it, I would actually say that we've already moved beyond the point where the mouse and keyboard uh, is the majority of the way we use computers. I would say we actually, it's a minority today. And while the mouse and keyboard isn't going to go away, the diversity of ways we use our computing devices is only going to go up. Uh, as it becomes increasingly popular to have more and more specialized devices where a mouse and keyboard is no good. So it'll always continue to be relevant, but it may make up a smaller portion of the kinds of devices we use. Now, this is going to be true about any other technology we get excited about, including touch, new types of touch systems, systems that deal with multiple people at the same time, improvements in speech, gesture input, uh, motion sensing, uh, facial recognition, other advances in computer vision, uh, wearable or, or improvements in display technology, uh, contact lenses that contain electronics that can sense uh, the liquid around our eyes, muscle-based computing, skin-based computing, or even you know, the sort of ambitious view of brain-based computing. All of these technologies, though, are different ways of trying to capture intent. They're not the magic bullet, but they do provide you some information about what the user is doing or thinking. And, but it doesn't come for free. Simply latching onto your favorite technology doesn't magically make you more aware of what the user wants to do. When people think about user experiences around a particular kind of technology, they often get really excited about, oh, gesture will do this, speech will do this, touch will do this, or X will do X. And that is true. When it works well, it's phenomenal. It feels like magic. But for any technology, there's a probability of cost. There's a probability that it didn't do the right thing, and the user now has a break in their user experience and a failure. And I think people, when they get really excited about new technology, forget about this second part. If you think about all the possible user experiences that we use computers in today, there's only some range in which the device you're working with, the application you're trying to build, doesn't suck. It's not going to cover every user scenario and every possible application. And when you're designing your software, when you're designing your hardware, you hope that the user starts somewhere in that good operating volume, they end up somewhere in that good operating volume, and that their entire user journey stays within the good operating volume of the technology you're trying to use. But this, again, doesn't come from the technology. It only comes from good experience design. So this idea of a broad-reaching new interaction technology, which is going to sweep the way we use computing, I would say is a myth. And although we love to talk about smartphones, it's important to remember it's less than 2% of all mobile phones. That's mostly because there's a ton of mobile phones out there. And it's less than 0.1% of all types of computing devices. So I would argue that we're in an era of specialization. And this means an era of divergence not one of convergence. And it's only the only people that are going to do interesting work in this area are people who focus on really good hardware, software, and user experience design like you guys. Thank you.